host of Wine Library TV, a.k.a. WLTV, and this is BBQ Central. We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Good evening and welcome to the really big barbecue central show. This is the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. Broadcasting live and direct from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio. It is the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I happen to be Greg Rempe. I am your program host. On your Tuesday evening, welcome aboard. If you want to jump in on the show via the email, you don't know the email address, I'm more than willing to help you out with that. If you want to hit me up on the emails, here's how you do it. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to greg at bbqcentralshow.com or on the Twitter and Instagrams at bbqcentralshow. Everything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening in case you didn't get the newsletter coming up in about, oh, let's call it 13 minutes from now. He is a Memphis in May world champion. He does teach barbecue competition cooking classes from time to time. He does support Operation Barbecue Relief in a large sense. He is selling stuff in the business of barbecue. And he just happens to be the National Barbecue and Grilling Association's current president. I am, of course, talking about Mark Lambert. He'll be joining me at 914. We'll be discussing the impending NBBQA conference that's coming up in the middle of March which I am about 98% committed to going at this point, maybe a little more than that on the percentage side. So we'll see what MBBQA is all about or National Barbecue and Grilling Association. I believe that name has changed thanks to uh, one Meathead Goldwyn at some point as well. So uh, I'm trying to get my shot straight here because I, I look off to me, but nevertheless, we'll continue on. I think Meathead had something to do with getting that name changed. The, the acronym still is the same, NBBQA, but I believe it is now pronounced the National Barbecue and Grilling Association. So we'll talk to Mark about that. We'll talk to him about Sweet Swine of Mine distributing as time allows. Also, what his competition season might have in play for 2018. And then we'll move on to 935, first timer to the show. If you follow Barbecue and Grilling on social media, I'm, I have to imagine that you follow this guy. He is got quite a name brand recognition with one big green egg, but I'm not talking about Ray Lampy this time. I am talking about a guy who goes on the handle Big Green Craig. Craig Tabor will be joining me, and we're going to be talking intently and in depthly about dry aging steak, beef to be specific. He just made a post a couple days ago about a 49 day old or 49 day dry aged piece of steak or beef. Maybe it was like a whole chunk and then he just cut off the portion that he wanted and maybe he's still dry aging the rest. So we will once again go ahead and recap exactly what dry aging is all about, what that brings to the table. How you might be able to do it at home if you want to be able to do it. We'll get into all the specifics. Then we'll talk to Craig about how you cook it, all that good stuff. So that's Big Green Craig at 935. And then the second hour, the fourth Tuesday of the month, brings the hotly anticipated and refiring of the embedded correspondence segment of the Barbecue Central Show. So there you have it. Uh, if time allows, depending on 
how we run with the embedded correspondence. We might have some time for free prizes. Everybody loves free stuff, so that's what's happening on your show this evening. Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com if you are looking to get in touch with me via the email at any point during the show. All right, let me ask you to do a, do me a favor if you're getting this in podcast. Please take time to rate and review this show, no matter what platform you're listening on, iPhone, Android, some type of podcast catcher, doesn't matter. Please let me know. Rate this show. Also rate the new supplemental show that we're launching every Friday, the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less. Rate both if you want, or rate one or the other. It helps bump up visibility for the particular platform, so I thank you in advance for that. Now, as we look back last week, first and foremost, tons of emails hitting the inbox telling me how riveting the Mike Cloud interview was from last week. And while I'm sure there were a number of you who enjoyed learning about the new World Food Championship rules and new platforms and partnerships with Walmart and all that stuff, the majority of the feedback was on the National Pro Barbecue Tour conversation that we had in the second segment. So... If you missed that interview or if you departed after the first segment that I had with Mike McLeod, go back on podcast and get that second segment, and you can do that whenever you want. Actually, I would encourage you, do that after this show. Don't leave now, but you can always get something that you missed via podcast, so subscribe there. You can do that on the website. Many reacting to what appear to be some backroom dealing Without Mike's knowledge, if you recall, Mike said that he had discussions uh, well in hand and that he was under the impression that somebody went behind his back without his knowing, essentially blowing up the deal. And I don't know if there was a deal in hand with Sam's itself, or maybe Sam's was looking to leave, but Mike had some other deal in hand to make it bigger or better. Whatever, but according to Mike, he had everything in hand to press ahead with a bigger, better series for this year of 2018 than someone or some people, no names, please. And rule number one applies simply because he gave no names. But their hands got into it, effectively ruined the series for 2018. That is Mike's side of the story. So please note that I have asked KCBS to come on the show to give their side of the story. So far, nothing. Certainly no surprise to me in that regard. But again, why not use this medium to give your side of what happened? And by the way, if there was some kind of screw-up or some type of misstep or we thought we could do something better than who we had contracted, take that opportunity to get out in front of it And either absorb some of or decrease some of the blowback that you might be getting. And say, hey, we realize that we might have screwed this up. Maybe you didn't screw it up. Maybe you thought you were doing the right thing and you come out and say, hey, we thought we were doing the right thing here. The platform is here for you to use. So we continue to get one side of the story. Always when it comes to things of this nature. So again... Why not take that opportunity, get out in front of it, or explain your side of why you did this or that? So that's that reaction to that segment. Also, many people appreciating the candid answer from Mike about why when I pressed him that the World Food Championships went from an all-cash contest to a cash and prize or prize purse contest. Now, Perhaps the people that appreciated the candor didn't necessarily like the fact that it went from all cash. But to his credit, he didn't deflect or sidestep the question or anything like that. He said, hey, I get it. Everybody likes 300 grand in cash. Doling out checks. Everybody digs it. However, the viability, this is just my take on what he was saying that the viability of World Food Championships wouldn't have sustained the longevity that has had, I believe we're going into this, is it the sixth year or something like that? But it wouldn't have exchanged, fifth year, wouldn't have exchanged, uh, wouldn't have uh, had the longevity that it has seen so far if it just would have strictly stayed a cash contest, and that he was 
turning away potential sponsors that wanted to donate product or whatever they're looking to do to kind of get on that World Food Championship train. And when he took over sales, he said, hey, I'm not going to turn people away. If they can meet a certain benchmark as far as prize is concerned, we'll add that to the purse. That can add a total amount to the overall amount of the purse. And now you can market a, you know, blah, blah, blah amount cash and prizes. Now, what the breakdown to that is, you got to look further into the information there. So a lot of people appreciating all of what Mike McLeod brought to the table. Again, his side. And there has been no communication from anybody else at this point. I can tell you from a programming note, we'll have Brad Leininger on from Getting Basted last week to talk about the news that we talked about last week about KCBS cutting the team of the year prize purses in half or the prize amounts in half, but then doubling back and saying, hey, uh, we realize we've made a mistake here, and we'll, we'll get into that in the second hour as time allows. Uh, let me talk to you quickly about Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue. Their curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies will get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything at BigPapaSmokers.com has been Pitmaster approved by Sterling Big Papa Ball himself. From award-winning rubs and sauces to American-made grills and smokers, Big Papa Smokers has everything you need to make your outdoor cooking even better than it currently is. Whether you're a backyard barbecue fanatic like me or a competition pro like my next guest, Mark Lambert, Big Papa Smokers has something for you. Big Papa Smokers is also known for their championship rubs and seasonings, popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, all proven winners on the competition circuit and in the backyard. Big Papa's offers 13 perfectly balanced flavors that will transform ordinary meals into extraordinary. If you're looking to improve your competition barbecue recipes, Big Papa Smokers combine forces with fellow rub company Simply Marvelous Barbecue to form what is now known as the West Coast Offense. Over the past few years, the West Coast offense has cornered the market on competitive barbecue and begun to redefine the flavor profiles that cooks across the country have begun to aim for. Stop by their site, pick some up today. Big Papa Smokers, the proud owner of Granny's Barbecue Sauce. Aside from Granny's, they also sell a bunch of other top-rated barbecue sauces. Visit BigPapaSmokers.com. And if you're looking for a cooker, might I interest you in a easy to use Mac two star general pellet grill. The only exclusive online Mac pellet grill dealer on the interwebs. They also offer special packages. How about the old Hickory Ace BP, the only charcoal cooker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trailer. If you're a backyard guy like me, the M grill from Texas is just what you need. We're going to have those guys on next week as well. If you're not sure of what grill you need, you can't go wrong. Just go to BigPapaSmokers.com. All their products featured on the website, hand-selected to help you barbecue better. 877-828-0727, 877-828-0727. If you have any questions, or again, shop the website, BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A, Smokers.com. Mark Lambert from Sweet Swine O'Mine on the other side. Stick around. We'll be right back. Live from the Barbecue Central Show Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Welcome back. This portion of the show is being brought to you by Butcher Barbecue. That's right, makers of award winning injections, marinades, rubs, seasonings, barbecue sauces, grilling oils, all of Butcher's barbecue products have been tested on the competition trail as well as in my backyard and other backyards worldwide. Be the pitmaster of your neighborhood, king of your cul-de-sac. Visit butcherbbq.com and stock up now. Always, and I say it again, always trust your butcher. All right, my first guest tonight, a Memphis and May world champion, taught barbecue classes, sells the Red Box Smoker. He is the current president of the National Barbecue and Grilling Association, the pitmaster of Sweet Swine O'Mine. 
Here to talk about the upcoming I Am Barbecue 2018 conference that will be held in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is certainly friend of the show, Mark Lambert. Hang up or press Blah. Blah. What? Mark, I'm calling you. Sorry. It's a New York number. It's probably fooling you. That's all right. We're going to call him right back. Now it's going to ring. I hate when I give the big lead up, right? And then it's like, uh, hey, hello. Hello. Hey, Mark. Hey. Greg from Barbecue Central. Good, good. Hey. Calling from a New York number. I tricked you, right? Mark? Yeah. You there, buddy? Hold on. I got to get to a better area. That's <laughs> terrible in this spot. Lick your finger and hang it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> How about it? Better? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Mark, appreciate you making time here for the show as always. And I guess before we get into the MBBQA and all that good stuff, I know Operation Barbecue Relief is kind of near and dear to your heart. Uh, they obviously saw a tremendous amount of work here with the national disasters uh, in 2017. But, you know, just from your standpoint, what does Operation Barbecue Relief mean to you? And when people ask you about it, uh, what do you tell them they do? And, and how do you encourage people to donate? And uh, for me, Operation Barbecue Relief, one, one, you know, one of the things that you talk, hold on just a moment. But, uh, uh, um, one of the things uh, about the uh, um, one of the most rewarding things is, is giving, uh, regardless of whether you have a lot of money or not. Uh, whether you have time to give, to give. At the end of the day, um, and unless you get to share that gift, it is, it's not that special. And so, whether you're helping people uh, by donating money or time or of a talent, uh, I think it's just important that people share them, share something uh, to those less fortunate and those in need. You know, the most rewarding thing to go to the next disaster is you see the need. You know, you see people that don't have anything, you know, that um, they're been ripped apart by natural disaster, or you see other people who are helping. And regardless, there's a huge need. Um, when you go and you actually see these people and you see the, you know, the communities coming together, it's just a really rewarding thing to be able to, to give your talents and your time the people that genuinely need it, rather than, you know, donating to, just donating money to the tree is one thing. It's all going to go to the front lines and be able to provide a talent and nourishment and see the actions from people. I mean, it's uh, when you actually go and get to be a part of it, it's special. Mark Lambert joining me here on the show, Pitmaster Sweet Swine O' Mine. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, talk a little bit about – National Barbecue Association here. You know, I've heard mixed reviews about the conference itself, Mark. So I'm sure you did too. But more of the mixing was previous to Linda Orson becoming president and then subsequently yourself serving in that role now. How has this event changed maybe over the last four or five years from kind of one of those conferences that has the potential of being something really good to what you guys, you and Linda, have been able to form it into over the last handful of years? Um, I think for so long, try to Hey, Mark, can I, let, let me interrupt you real quick. Can I try and call you back? I mean, you're, you sound like you're underwater there real quick. I'm oh, sorry. That's uh, right. It's probably not you. It's probably the signal in here. Hold on. Let me see. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um. You know, for the longest time, I think it was a. Uh, it's always been about networking. At the end of the day, um, the you know the greatest thing about the National Barbecue Association is, uh, just like with OBR, people that have a talent, they come together to share their talents to help one another, um, not just to help one another in business, but the industry as a whole. Um, and it's it's sort of a. It's always just just been a huge networking event where people get together and help one another, and it's. It creates opportunity. Anytime you put people together, um, 
with such common interest and diverse experiences and talents, when you put those people together, you create opportunity. And that's really what it's always been about. And, you know, I think it's one of those things that has to be the right situation for the person that's there um, for it to fit the need. I guess what I'm saying is that, um, you know, every year there's different people there. There's different situations and different experiences. But at the end of the day, when you go put yourself in an environment where people are doing what you want to be doing, um, you know, it creates opportunity. And that's one of the things that we've been trying to enhance is create more opportunity, more chances for people to interact, more opportunities for people to learn and share their experiences and talents. And, um, you know, I, I've been a part of it, I guess, since 2005. And, you know, I learn something every year. I meet someone new every year. I, I you know, gain new experience or a new sponsor or, um, you know, a new customer. So every year, um, you know, I'm continually re-encouraged to, uh, to put something more into the to the association every year because it seems like I'm always getting something back and getting it back, you know, tenfold. So if uh, if you've been to the conference in the past, um, I think that's one of the, the experience, one of the problems that a lot of people have. They feel like they they just go to the conference, sign up for a seminar, um, go on a bus tour, sit in a the and at the end of the day, if, if all you do and all you're a part of is what's on the agenda, I think that there's the hang up for a lot of people. And, it, you know, everyone, not everyone's outgoing and not everyone feels like, feels comfortable, um, you know, stepping into a conversation or, you know, putting themselves out there with, uh, you know, like actually being a part of the conference, like producing a seminar, producing a demo, or, you know, being on the committee to put it together. Uh, what I have found is that when you immerse yourself in that association, um, you, you people see you for who you really are and will believe in you uh, rather than just sitting next to someone in a conference or in a bar. I have found that um, – and really, it really never had any aspirations of becoming president, but just through being involved, that's just kind of where it went. So um, I think if if you're wondering whether it's for you or not – to me, just going to the conference isn't isn't worth it. But to actually go and be a part of it and immerse yourself in the conference, um, contribute into the conference, whether it be in the form of um, a seminar or demo or um, you know even next year being on the committee or something like that. I think when the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. That's what I found. So is that something that you would have? I mean, obviously this year is all filled up, the agenda set, but. Going forward, would you have to get in contact with somebody like yourself or send in an inquiry email to, you know, whoever at MBBQA and say, hey, I, I want to put on a dry aging meat breakout segment or I want to talk about uh, podcasting or whatever and roll it in, in, or produce something there? That's something that would be up for consideration. Absolutely, yeah. And, and when I – the first one I went to, I went in with no um, – you know, pre preconceived notions of wanting to be involved. I just walked in and I met someone that I knew, which was Kel Phelps with, with the National Barbecue News. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm just not comfortable unless I'm busy doing something and contributing. I just I watched, we started talking. And I said, Kel, are you what are you doing? What are you doing here? And he was the president at the time. And he said, Well, we're putting on a, a judging seminar. I said, Well, what can I do to help you? I said, I'm not doing anything here. I mean, there's nothing going on right now that I'm signed up for. What can I do to help you? And then next thing you know, you're it just kind of it snowballed, and I started helping them with a lot of the different elements of the conference. And um, next thing you know, you're involved, and they're asking you to do more, and you take up more responsibility. And I think the main thing is, uh, regardless of whether that you're you're uh, signed up now for a seminar or uh, able to contribute this year, go and you know stick your foot in the door. You know, some some people aren't as comfortable with sticking their foot in the door as others, but I encourage you to. to uh, uh, where you find an area that you're that you're interested in, walk up, introduce yourself to the person that's involved uh, or managing that segment, and and ask to help, ask to volunteer. You know they'll take you up on it. Mark Lambert joining me here on the show talking about the National Barbecue and Grilling Conference coming up here in mid March. Right, Mark, so let's break it down a little bit as far as this year is concerned. What are the dates, and uh, from a high level, what do you have planned over those uh, three four days? 
Uh, March 14th to the 17th, so the first day, uh, it's downtown Fort Worth at the uh, Renaissance Worthington is the conference hotel at the Renaissance Worthington. But, you know, a lot of conferences you go to are actually in a hotel conference center, and the Worthington is a conference hotel. But we're not a really – we're not a typical conference because we're a group of hospitality people. So we uh, come together to share our experiences and talents in the hospitality world and barbecue. So we, in order to do that, we have to be hands-on. And so hotel conference centers make their money around um, catering and drinks and, and not the rooms. So we're – our um, – Conference is actually off-site uh, near downtown, near the stockyards in Fort Worth, Texas, at the uh, River Ranch Resort, and it's sort of like a, a standalone meeting conference area, but it has huge outdoor settings, outdoor stage, outdoor porches. It's, uh, of course, because of the stockyards, has a Western theme, um, but a really good group of people that's owned by the same people that own Billy Bob's, and so the, the tonight we have a, a welcome reception at the uh, River Ranch Resort, um, sort of heavy hors d'oeuvres in a bar. Uh, a lot of it's going to be hosted by Yeti Coolers. Um, they've stepped up and taken that this year and made that their uh, made that their baby to make the welcome night a really uh, nice time at the River Ranch Resort. And then on uh, throughout Wednesday, our uh, barbecue bus tours going to some of the well-known barbecue places around Fort Worth and Dallas. And uh, one of the new, like, really souped-up food courts, we're, uh, they're actually going to that and getting some behind-the-scenes tours at this huge uh, food court. I can't remember the name of it the top of my head. Anyway, um, Thursday and Friday will be packed with educational seminars, both for people that are in the business of barbecue, um, you know, truck operators, restaurateurs, um, anything from, you know, back of the house to, uh, it could be uh, menu pr menu development, or it could be uh, human resources, um, all the way to you know, actually about the food, whether it be a, about a seminar on beef brisket or lamb or um, bartending. I mean, there's tons of different seminars that'll be available throughout the day. And of course, tonight we'll have uh, showcase meals that are done by um, a lot of the the vendors like Smithfield and. Prairie Fresh and people like that are going to actually do some showcase meals uh, throughout the night and throughout the day as well. Um, but different seminars are available. It's education time, and then there's a lot of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and you know a lot of uh, um, uh, lots of uh, lots of educational things going on at the bar. You know, <laughs> there's a, a lot of uh, networking that goes on at the bar in between classes and in between lunch and and after hours around the campfire out back. So. Um, Saturday, uh, on, so fr Thursday and Friday will be the educational sessions and the showcase meals, and then Saturday is the uh, Barbecue and Grilling Academy. And Barbecue and Grilling Academy sort of um, brings in a different element to the conference. It brings in some of the people that um, maybe weren't members before that are new members or people that are just interested in barbecue and grilling want to learn more from some of the, you know, some of the big names in the industry. And there'll be a tons of uh, seminars going on about you know, how to cook different things and how to cook on different types of equipment, how to prepare world champion ribs or, you know, tons of different seminars that are going out. But it's focused a little bit more on the end product instead of just the business of barbecue. Uh, celebrating barbecue and we'll have a uh, SEA sanctioned steak cook off. Tons of uh, great, good barbecue and good drinks and good networking on Saturday. Sounds like a bless. Uh, there's still time to register, correct, Mark? Absolutely. Yeah, you can register. Uh, even you know, you can register on site. Uh, of course, it's a little more expensive mm -hmm. if you register on site than if you pre-register. But yeah, you can show up and register on site. But uh, you know, go to uh, the National Barbecue Association website and click on events and 2018 MBQA. I am barbecue and sign up. And it's, it's of course it's cheaper for members than it is non-members. You can sign up for a full conference, or if you can pick a day that you want to attend, but, um, uh, I encourage you to get involved. That's where you're going to get the most, reap the most of the benefits from your not only membership but your registration. Check it out at mbbqa.com and sign up for one day, all days. Uh, come and see Mark. Come and see me. It's going to be fun and fantabulous. Mark, let me ask you a. Uh, this is a hard transition, and I apologize, but a, a question about smokers. If you're 
so inclined. Uh, this one coming in through Facebook from Tammy and Brian. It says, Mr. Mark Lambert, what's your take on cabinet smoking in dry climates? Want to get a red box, but everyone tells me cabinet smoking is tough to pull off in Colorado. Altitude, dry climate. Do I need a fan of some sort for proper airflow? Any advice? Much appreciated. Yes, sir. Dry and high elevation, especially high elevation. Um, you know, it, it changes the boiling point of water, which makes a huge difference not only in the uh, in airflow and how the air comes into the cooker. Uh, it, it also changes the rate at which the meat cooks because it changes the boiling point of water. So, um, certainly a fan at higher temperatures. You know, I like to use, if I use briquettes at uh, sea level, uh, if I move up in elevation, a lot of times I will use more pre-lit charcoal rather than allowing the charcoal to light as it goes along. You know, some people will add a chimney or a small portion will, uh, have to, you know, either burn like a snake or, or um, you know, light from one side of the firebox to the other. But in those high, high elevations, typically where you, you, you got thinner air, um, I like to have a lot hotter charcoal base regardless of what type of cooker I'm using. I like to have a lot more lit fuel. Um, the more lit fuel you have, the more air it's going to draw into the firebox. All right, so let's kind of keep with that uh, cooking question here real quick. This one coming in from Lori Stevenson. How to barbecue in sub-zero temps? I believe this person is in that upstate New York area, if I'm not mistaken. Uh-huh. Um, again, same thing, I think, uh, making sure that um, in the sub-freezing temperatures, uh, a lot of that comes with heavy wind and making sure that your your cooker is facing maybe not right into the wind or away from the wind, but a lot of times at an angle, at a, at a 45 degree angle to the wind, seems to work best in high wind. Um, sure that the wind is not blocking or blowing down your exhaust pipe or giving it reverse flowing. And what that does is air blows down your exhaust pipe, it inhibits the fire drawing it in and yep. eventually, um, you know, cool your cooker down and, and I've seen even put a fire out. So making sure. Oh. Uh, what's that? Oh, I thought I lost you there for a sec. All of a sudden you just cut right out. Uh, yeah. just, uh, sorry. This building's got terrible uh, service and it's cold outside. Yeah, I bet. So we um, want to, we want to make sure we're out of the wind so we don't put our own fire out through a, uh, like a reverse draft. Yeah, so you're slowing your, your draft up, uh, cooling your temperatures down, making sure that you get something to block the wind. Uh, and, again, starting with that larger base of charcoal or that larger base of coals before you start cooking to make sure that it's drawing air in there uh, at, a, at a rapid pace and you've got, you know, enough, uh, enough heat so that the, the coal doesn't zap the heat out of your cooker. Mark Lambert is my guest, Sweet Swan of my Pitmaster, president of the National Barbecue and Grilling Association. Don't forget that conference is taking place March 14th through the 17th, so sign up if you haven't already because you're going to be down in that Dallas-Fort Worth area. Mark, always appreciate the time. Thanks so much for doing it. Thanks for uh, asking us to be on the show. Looking forward to seeing you guys down there, and we'll uh, have a big time. All right, See there he is, Mark Lambert. Sweet Swine oh mine. By the way, he is a... Uh, Memphis and May barbecue world champion. If you need him, that's what, I mean, he was very quick to go transition from the business guy of national barbecue and grilling association president to, Oh, well, if you're going to be at sea level add this many more briquettes, if you're cooking with that and do this, if you're in the wind and sub zero, I mean, guy can roll on a dime, no doubt. So we appreciate that again, the website, if you want to register for that conference, NBBQA, like uh, November Bravo Bravo Quebec Alpha dot com or I am BBQ two zero one eight dot com. That'll get you to both. Uh, that'll get you the registration if you want to do it. Again, I'll be there uh, broadcasting live for two hours Thursday, Friday, Saturday. All right, if you're looking to turn up the heat on your barbecue skills this summer. You're going to need to get your hands on the most advanced ceramic cooker and high-tech barbecue accessory to hit the market. We're talking about the all-new Monolith Barbecue Guru Edition and CyberQ Cloud Controller. Launched early last year by Barbecue Guru, the world's first temperature-controlled ceramic cooker and grill with a built-in power draft fan. It's going to give you the easiest, most successful barbecue experience. These must-have new items will make barbecuing easier than ever before. 
and you'll be a new secret weapon holder to make cooking delicious barbecue each and every time. Ready to buy? Yeah, of course you are. Head on over to bbqguru.com and grab them up while they last. If you have any questions about what to order, please call them. That number is 800-288-GURU. Again, that's 800-288-GURU or visit the website bbqguru.com. The Barbecue Guru continues to be a breakthrough in barbecue technology. Big Green Craig makes his debut right after this. Stick around. Ready to get on the air. Call 216-220-0966. Now, let's get back to the LeBron James of Barbecue Talk. Craig Rampey. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. You can visit CookinPellets.com, that's C-O-O-K-I-N, CookinPellets.com for more information or purchase. You can download their free app and be alerted when great shipping deals take place. Visit Amazon.com to purchase as well. If you would rather do that, no problem. Easy to do cookingpellets.com. All right. My next guest, widely recognizable on social media channels, is Big Green Craig. He does appearances, cooks, teaches blogs, kind of does it all in the live fire realm. Tonight, we're talking about dry aging beef at home or maybe off site, how to cook it once it is dry aged, and some other barbecue and grilling related stuff as time allows. For the first time ever, let's go beyond the Thunderdome and welcome in Big Green Craig. Again, Craig Tabor joining me. Craig, how are you, buddy? Bam! Thanks for having me, Greg. Appreciate no it. Uh, Beyond the Thunderdome, we're here live on the... That's not me. No. Um, I'll get you there, though. Don't worry. <laughs> I got you. No worries, man. Appreciate you having me here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, Greg. Oh, come on, man. I have you. Where are you? Now, hold on a second. <laughs> now we got to... I had you here somewhere. Oh, wait. I know what I did. I didn't know if we were going to do Skype video or not. So hold on. Here we go. Boom. Okay. Oh, now I'm frozen. Here we go. There you are. There. Hey, there he is. Look at that guy. Earth. That's you. You're not Mark Lambert. Hey. I'm not Mark Lambert, no. Before we get into the dry aging talk and the ways to cook it, for the folks that maybe aren't as intimately familiar with you and what you're up to, can you give us a little background about yourself and how you get into the live fire barbecue and grilling industry? Sure. So I, I, I fell into it out of necessity, actually. Um, I, I've, I've always been a griller and, and I've always had an offset pit. And um, uh, one day my wife just decided she's, she's done cooking. She's a fantastic cook. She's Italian. I can eat her gravy over top of the stove with a spoon. Um, <laughs> she, she just decided she's lost her passion for it. It's done. And so at that point, I've, I've decided to myself, I'm either stuck eating um, – Stouffer's lasagna for the rest of my life or pork shoulders and ribs, which is all I was cooking before. So I, so I kind of had to, I kind of had to expand my horizons or I was stuck. What happens if your wife wasn't married to you? Was she just going to waste away or was she just going to pick one item to eat for the rest of her life? And that was it. Oh no, there's, there's plenty of frozen options out there. And so what <laughs> happened, it, it transferred into, um, what can I cook next that I've not cooked? And a lot of what holds me out of the barbecue competitions and KCBS and mm. stuff, that's fun. And don't get me wrong, I, I cook briskets and, and chicken and ribs and mm -hmm. all the categories, but um, I, I, I'm, 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 I've got ADD bad, and I can't cook the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. I've got to have I'm – not, I'm not saying it's not a challenging. It's definitely challenging, but I, I like to reach outside the box and, and – you know, reach to the, the 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 far corners to find out what I can grill. You know, something else, something else new and exciting. Variety is the spice of life for Big Green Craig. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Um, are you officially sponsored by Big Green Egg at all? I mean, Big Green Craig, Big Green Egg. I mean, there seems like a synergy there that just can't be denied. Um, no, I'm not. What? Um, you know what what ended up happening was I got my first egg because I was the guy. Um. 
I, I know this is sacrilegious. I was the guy that was, was tired of throwing sticks onto a fire all night long to have barbecue on a Sunday afternoon. Yep. And, um, you know, I, I got my first egg and, and actually through a buddy of mine, he says, yeah, I throw this, uh, I light the fire, I close it up. I, I, I you know, uh, next morning, boom, barbecue. And I thought, it, it, stop, it, it can't be that easy. Well, what happened was I started getting into it and they do call it the ultimate cooker. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't using it to that advantage. Uh, um, uh, advanced technique yet but no I'm not sponsored by them um, that, that that is how I got my start but I've I've, I've kind of mastered their world um, mm -hmm. I've won their national event um, back to back years um, I do all, a, a lot of their regional events where I'll, I'll show up I'll do several grilling demos and um, uh, Etc. Um, but uh, you know since conquering their world I've really tried to reach out into other live fire arenas um you know there's 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 lots of different uh, fuel sources um in the thunderdome right now and i'm really enjoying mastering those as well is the big green craig brand your full-time job or do you have something else that supplements the live fire cooking passion um, right now, my I, I do have a Monday through Friday. Um, the, the the Big Ring Craig brand, I would say, is is close to to, to, to launching full time. Yeah. Um, we've got 2018 for me is is is, is booked. Um, I've I've got some big things on the horizon, some partnerships, some um, some products coming out here here in 2018. So I'm looking forward to that. It should be exciting. The website, by the way, is biggreencraig.com if you want to check it out here while we're talking. All right, Craig, so let's talk about dry aging, and it, obviously it's been around forever, at least for those of us that are kind of even mediocre in the industry, and I think we've seen more of a movement, just my perception, but more of movement to dry aged beef here over the last, let's say, two, three years than we have at, at any point. Can you break down what dry aging is and what it does to the meat? Just on high level. Sure, absolutely. So um, it, we, we've all cut into a cryo vac of a. I'll, I'll use a brisket, you know, uh, as example. We cut into a cryo vac, and we think, "Ooh, there's blood in there," and that that's not true. What that is is that is a uh, um, a wet cure agent. Um, every cut of beef is is aged. There, there's wet aging. There's dry aging. Wet aging is more of an accelerated uh aging they can they can they can they can tenderize the beef in uh you know a matter of days to you know a week or so uh you, you don't get the same deep uh rich beefy flavor that you get with a dry aging the dry aging the enzymes really um break down the beef and, and you're talking you're talking wet aging from three to four to seven days to um, I, I, I've been talking to my butcher. He prefers a 49 day dry age. Hmm. And he really talks about once it hits that 41 to 42 day mark, the enzymes really start to soften up the beef and tender the beef, tenderize the beef and really enhance the beefy flavor. And, um, that's what I've been doing lately. I, I've, um, I'm a huge fan of, uh, I think we can all say we like ribeyes. Um, I, I've been buying the, the the primal ribeyes from my butcher. I bring them home. I dry age them for 49 days, and it's the the most tenderest, beefiest uh, ribeye that I've ever had. I, I love buying dry aged beef, but who, who who can afford to do that on a on a uh, you know a Tuesday night all the time? I I don't know. Not me. Uh, I've, evidently not you either. So. It sounds like you're doing this at home. Uh, I, I've always heard that go to your hometown butcher, make best friends with him, and he's going to be able to do things for you that the grocery store, big box store butcher just isn't going to be able to. Inevitably, that conversation runs down the hall to dry aging. But is that true? Like, do you think a, a mom and pop butcher would offer that service? Or is that something that you're going to have to ask for? And then does it eventually put you out of that cost competitiveness category as well. It first off, if you're not friends with your butcher, shame on you because you're 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 missing out on all kinds of awesomeness. They see me pull in the in, in, in the, uh, the the parking lot and they run to the back and just start grabbing random random stuff because they know that I'm gonna you know I'm gonna Jones all over it and yep. and, and it's probably gonna go home with me and and uh, I'm in there a few weeks ago and they say hey we got you know these. Uh, 
you know, these veal chops in, and they were just absolutely gorgeous. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, you know, do you want any of these? It's how many do you want? Right. Of course, you know, I went home with a couple of them. But um, definitely know your butcher. I'm lucky enough to to have a, a butcher close to me. Um, I drive past them every day of my life on my way to the office. Uh, it's Patton's Meat Market in Duluth, Georgia. And those guys are doing their own dry aging. Mm. And, and, you know, <laughs> I go in there, I look, and I'm like, hey, is that one about ready? And, you know, they'll cut it for me. And, you know, and I, I go home with dry aged beef. Now, the downside to that is, you know, if you were to buy that, 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 that cut, a regular steak you're, you're looking at 9.99 a pound or you know yeah. 10 you know whatever it is very minimal uh you know hey it's been sitting in my case for 49 days you know we've put the time and the effort and the care into it now it goes all the way up to a you know a 35 dollar uh, uh per pound cut oh, wow. and that's what really got me into wanting to do my own all right so talk to me about the dry aging at home i've heard all sorts of cautionary tales and it's really prohibitive and there's a lot of equipment to buy blah 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 i did interview a guy that created this thing called the steak ager a couple of years ago which seemed like a decent product but seemed limited in size as far as what you could put in it so i'm getting questions like from doug Shiding asking you know what do you do at home to dry age your beef for 40 days so what's the setup well great question um there's multiple ways obviously you you hit the the the, the nail on the head um you got to have some caution when you're doing this there are at home units what what's different than what what's different than the the case that my butcher uses versus my regular refrigerator? It's got exact temperature control, not just up down, you know, colder, less cold, whatever. It also controls the humidity inside of the uh, uh, the, the dry aging unit, mm -hmm. and um, those are two things that you you can't control in a regular refrigerator. Now I've I've seen guys um, I've never tried it myself. I've seen guys take the cheesecloth method um they wrap it in cheesecloth i don't know four or five times set it in the refrigerator there's a lot of um to me when i researched this this uh, method god there were so many so many steps and tricks and you had to you know every four or five days you're down changing the dressing and and you know it, it really takes a long time to do that i went with the uh umai dry bag system it's a, uh, a vacuum seal system. <laughs> you fit your whole primal ribeye into this vacuum seal bag. How big is that? Like how many pounds we talk? Oh, you can get a, you know, every cow's different, but you can get them from 18 pounds to 22, 24 pounds. Wow. They can be big. What are you paying per and pound on that? If I'm buying by the whole primal and I'll, I'll buy, I'll buy it prime grade. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wow. My butcher will sell it to me for, I think it's 12 99 a pound. For prime beef, yeah, nice. And uh, so, so it's literally as easy with these bags. It's literally as easy as vacuum sealing it up, making sure that the bag has a nice uh, contact with the um, with, with the, the, the the surface of the beef. You vacuum seal it, and I put it on a footed cooling rack. I put it in my refrigerator, and I look at my phone, and I set a date for 49 days in the future, and I try to forget about it. And it's it's almost like Christmas a little bit when that yeah. alarm goes off, ding ding ding, hey, dry aged beef is here, and you know it's it, it's fun um, trimming the steaks to see. You know when you buy a when, anytime you buy a primal cut, you you know you're 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 not sure 100 percent of what the marbling is going to be inside of that. It's not like buying a steak in the case. You can pick out which which steak that you want and and and, and find the marbling. But my guys over there do they do a fantastic job in picking out the right ones for me every time. So when the Christmas bell goes off and that eighteen to twenty four pound primal matures to the point that you want it, when you start breaking it down, you don't keep it in that bag then, right? I mean, you now portion it out and then do you? food saver bag the rest of them to have access whenever you want do you freeze those that you're not going to eat what do you care for after that 49 days so when i do that um it it, it, it depends i've dry aged it for a party where we cook all the steaks up right then and there oh my god um <laughs> right <laughs> goodbye if 49 I'm, days <laughs> yeah right <laughs> 49 days for one night yeah wow <laughs> um nine times out of ten what i'll do is i'll portion them up i'll put them into a food saver bag um 
I've got three freezers, so it's kind of it's very important for me to mark when I you know when I did this yeah. and what 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 month and the date and everything on it. But um, yeah, I mean it's as simple as that. Um, it comes out beautifully. The the color changes so much during that. Basically, what you're doing is you're you're you're, you're, you're controlling. Um, the, you're, you're controlling the rapid um, um, breakdown of the meat, so the the, the, the meat is uh, the, the beef is so purple and nice and tender. You know, you, you push your finger into the center of it, and it leaves a divot there. It's absolutely hmm. perfect what you're looking for. When I look at dry aged beef and all these videos that you see anymore, you have that. Uh, there's a technical name for it, but I don't know. But there's that moldy shell that you see on the outside. Same thing with the umami bag that that forms too. It's definitely um, it's it's very waxy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've heard guys say, "Well, you know, that, that's the best part of the steak." They um, eat it. They eat it. I, you know, I can't get past eating that part. So, wow. you know, what I what I don't do when I before I put it in the bag, I don't tr or or any anytime you dry age, you want to keep all the fat on it. So you're not you're not like like a brisket. You're not trimming all the fat off. You want to leave all that fat on there to help that. Uh, um, that's that's basically food for the enzymes that's, yep. that are breaking this thing down, and uh, so leave all that on there. But you know, I, I, I trim it off, and it's it's real thin. Um, I don't I, I don't care for it, and and my wife doesn't either. So we, we we get rid of it. Cooking wise, what's your steak process? Uh, okay, so I've I've done these dry aged steaks any way you can possibly imagine. Um, and, and I know this is a barbecue show, but I don't know how. How uh, relevant sous vide is? Is so, sous vide well, I mean, a thing on the show? Yeah, on, are you kidding? We talk about it all the time. We, we argue about it, but we talk about it uh, consistently, I would say. I've, I've tried sous vide. Um, that's great in a pinch where you need time to be on your side. Um, I've tried the reverse sear where you smoke it first and then you do it with a hot yeah, sear. Yeah. Um, I've tried, you know, cast iron skillets, um, every which way. For me, when I'm dry aging a, a ribeye, there's going to be one proven method and that's going to be hot and fast hmm. i'm grilling that guy just like the the steak cooking association you know um total four four and a half minutes total and that is absolutely fantastic are you inch and a quarter guy or are you inch and a half guy or what you know people get caught up in well i you know i want to have this I see it all the time on social media. Well, I, you know, I want my I want, want my steak to be two inches thick and three inches thick. And honestly, the problem is, you know, the the thicker you get, you, you're you're spreading that crust out, and mm. the inside of it, uh, unless you've done a some sort of brine with it or or, or a cure with it, you know, the inside is just chewy beef. There's no flavor to it. I'm I'm definitely an inch and a quarter guy for a steak. Um, roast is a little bit different, but but uh, definitely an inch and a quarter guy when I'm when I'm grilling hot and fast. Craig, I have a question from Don Robinson coming in from Facebook. Uh, he kind of went over it a little bit, but uh, once again, when you talk about the 49-day dry, uh, dry age, how do you determine what to trim after that time has elapsed? When you pull it out of the bag, you'll definitely know what to trim. Um, you'll, it, it, first off, when you pull it off, when you pull it out of that bag, the whole thing is waxy. So basically, I mean, common sense is to take all the wax off. Um, once you start trimming that wax off, you'll get down into the white, um, the white of the fat, and uh, you know that that it, it, it's it's once you pull it out, it's it, it's self-explanatory. Got it. BigGreenCraig.com is his website. Forty nine, forty nine, forty nine day dry aged steak. That's the way to do it. Uh, I would assume if people have more questions in this regard, they can hit you up on the website or find you on the social media haunts. Absolutely, hit me. I'm uh, I'm at Big Green Craig pretty much everywhere, and um, I'll be happy to answer any kind of questions. BigGreenCraig.com is the website. Find them on social media at Big Green Craig. Craig, really appreciate the time, man. Thanks so much for doing it. You got it, man. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me. You got it. There he is, Big Green Craig, right there, Craig Tabor. Appreciate him going a little long. Great information right there. So always appreciate that. Again, if you have any questions about the 49-day dry aged, how to do it, is it safe, make sure it's safe, all that good stuff, hit them up, Big Green Craig, C-R-A-I-G, BigGreenCraig.com. I'm going to talk to you quickly about Cook Shack, manufacturer of smoker ovens for barbecue lovers with any amount of experience, whether you barbecue in the backyard, in the competition circuit, or in a five-star dining facility. 
Cook Shack has the unit that will do the job. And with a full line of barbecue, sauces, spices, pellets, and wood chunks, it's the perfect one-stop shop. Cook Shack strives to be your barbecue resource center by offering cooking classes, online recipes, how-to videos, two blogs, smoke and grilling 101s, and a video cooking classroom. Check out their website at cookshack.com or follow them on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Google+. Get advice and share your passion for barbecue on their world-class barbecue forum. They still have one of those. Cook Shack pellet-fired smokers are the choice of champions because they were designed by a champion. You ever heard of them? Ed Fest, Eddie Borg. The FEC 100, PG 1000, always customer favorites. The PG 1000 can actually double as a smoker and a grill. Slow and low or hot and fast, the pellet grill line gives you the most for your money. How about electric smokers? Glad you asked. It just so happens that the Cook Shack residential electric smoker is the number one smoker in the industry. High quality means high durability and versatility. Anything you can cook in your oven, you can make in a Cook Shack. Passion and dedication drives Cook Shack's manufacturing with quality always being at the top of the priority list. Get the best in barbecue since 1962. Call 800-423-0698. That's 800-423-0698. Or visit the website cookshack.com. That's the good folks over at Cook Shack. Thanks again to Craig Tabor for joining me. Hmm. Well, let's just see what happens here. Got a call coming in. Don't know how that's going to work out, but. We might pick it up just to see what happens before the end of the uh, first hour. Stick around. Be right back. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue. It's the Barbecue Central Show. All right. Thanks again to Big Green Craig for joining me last segment. All right. You're on the air. Go ahead. Okay. How you doing, bud? Okay, who's this? This is Austin from uh, 616 Barbecue and Fabrication. Hi, Austin. So, what do you think about the KCBS thing? About the what? KCBS with the uh, payouts and everything. Oh, well, we'll uh, be getting into that a little bit here in the next segment, but uh, from what I hear... They have made reparation. They'll be paying out accordingly before the uh, untold decision was made to half it. So, uh, actually, Brad Leininger will be on the show next week to talk about it as well. So, uh, hopefully, you'll tune in next week, all right? Yeah, definitely. Appreciate the call in. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. It's Austin 616. That's right. I'm always leery. No offense, Austin, but I'm always leery of the phone call in the middle of the show when it's not an open segment. It's worked 50-50 for me in the past. You never know. Oh, that's right. David Huff has the steak ager. Wow, look at that thing. Oofa. I'm, so, I'm looking at pictures that you can't see. That's all right. Sorry about that. Huh. That looks really good. Let me see this. Oh, boy. Now, you, you don't want to see these pictures. Trust me. That's a steak ager. Wow, look at that thing coming out of the... Hold on. This is what the uh, steak looks like out of the steak ager. Look at that. Are you kidding me? That looks pretty moldy. That's the part you want to cut off. (laughs) Right, right, Craig? You want to trim that part off, I think? No doubt. Wow. All right, now fit back in there. That's right. What a great shot. Boomba. All right. uh, BigGreenCraig.com is his website. If you have any questions, give him an email or hit him up on social media at BigGreenCraig. He will answer your dry aging questions. I know most of you, we kind of glossed over the setup in depth. Maybe we could have him back on and talk about the complete in-depth setup, but it sounded like the umami bags are a key component. Also having some type of a temperature control the unit that can also control humidity that is also a a large factor so i don't think you just want to put it in a bag and toss it in your refrigerator in the back and cross your fingers and hope for the best especially when you're spending that kind of money 13 bucks a pound on 24 pounds is you know pretty decent chunk 
All right, we will step away and load up for the second hour. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central show right here on the Barbecue Central Network. Stick around. I'll be right back. Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine. How you doing? <laughs> you have a great show. I'm a big fan. Boing. So what, what, what seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead, and he's in the, in the crackle. Charbono. It's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish. What? He ate 50 before we nursed. Listen, Lavernius, shut your face. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seeds. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. <laughs> top men. All right, just like that, we are into the second hour. Big congratulations to you. You found the Barbecue Central show. Half of your night has now been accomplished in the right way. And you will now enjoy a full hour of barbecue and grilling talk, should you see fit. Stick around. You never know what's going to happen. Still to come on the show tonight, the embedded correspondence segment, David Huff. Steve Ray, Doug Scheiding, in no particular order. We'll be talking about various barbecue and grilling topics, cooking topics, recipes, you name it. It's kind of a free-for-all. We do it the fourth Tuesday of every month. If you want to get in touch with the show, here's how you can do it. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to greg at bbqcentralshow.com or on the Twitter and Instagram at bbqcentralshow. Hey, let me remind you of something because, as I had mentioned last week right around this time, Facebook was uh, screwing with a lot of the business pages or fan pages or whatever you want to call it. Not your personal page, but, you know, inevitably you have to make a personal page and then you can make the fan page or, or whatever. So I have my Greg Rempe personal page and then I have the Barbecue Central Show page. And they said, hey, we're not going to bombard your feed with businesses and we know you value your correspondence with people you like and your friends and whatever which has pretty much rendered my ability to boost the video post uh fruitless i guess or they want me to pay exorbitant fees because you know the show this show is a two-hour show right oh well raleigh smoke on youtube saying hey we're here, Greg, on YouTube. Too much drama on Facebook. I get it. Throw out your questions in the chat. I mean, I'll answer them. Just so happens I got a really neat plug-in from somebody that likes Facebook a lot. We need to find somebody that likes YouTube just as much, and then we can show them both. No offense. Just ask your questions. I got you. Kinger's in Facebook. Len's in Facebook. Raleigh Smoke's in Facebook. Love to see it. Multiple platforms. Got roughly 100 people on the audio-only stream. So however you like to consume the show live, and then most of you get it on podcast. We all know that, of course. So anyway, if you go to my Facebook fan page, uh, let me see if I can pull it back up again. Facebook, Barbecue Central Show. Here we go. Here's what you do. You uh, scroll down. Uh, first, right here, if you're watching on video, uh, you go to the liked button and you like it. And then just to the right of it, there's a thing that says following. And if you click on that, and uh, you will be, a oh, wow, look at that. It's, it, it appears we're catching up at a, a fantastic rate, as they say. Let's uh, try this again. All right. So as you can see, if you hit uh, following here, and then right here in your news feed, see first. Make sure the click button is there, and then you go. Easy enough. That's how you do it. That way, whenever, like, a video pops up that's new or I make a great post about something very important to the world of barbecue and grilling, 
it'll show up right at the top of your news feed. I did lag out, by the way, but my frames should not be dropping anymore. You know, just refresh. I'll be back. Don't worry. So that's uh, what you want to do for me. Make sure that the show page is in your see first Facebook. Hey, you know who else is in uh, YouTube? John Dawson. He's a celebrity. Uh, if you follow me on Facebook, you would have seen, according to Texas Monthly Barbecue, written by Daniel Vaughn, Salt Lake co-founder, Asaku Roberts dies at age 104. So, 104? Gotta give it props. 104. <laughs> I'm debating whether or not I want to press out to 74. Hisaku Roberts makes it to 104. <laughs> Holy moly. Hisaku Roberts, age 104, passed away peacefully this past Thursday night. She founded the Salt Lake Barbecue in Driftwood with her husband, Thurman, in 1967. On land, the Roberts family settled in in the 1870s. It was just a pit by the road back then, but quickly grew into a bona fide restaurant after Thurman passed away in 1981. Hisaku ran the Salt Lick until her son Scott gave her a break in 1987. Scott Roberts, by the way, no relation to former barbecue sauce and rub reviewer Scott Roberts. <clears throat> Scott Roberts still operates what has become a massive and beloved operation in Driftwood and in multiple locations beyond. How about that? The barbecue at the Salt Lick has those familiar flavors of Texas smoked meat, but some of the side offer a few surprises influenced by Isaku's Japanese heritage and Hawaiian background, the vinegar slaw with black sesame seeds and the mayo-free potato salad with celery seed. I'm sorry, yeah, celery seed were Hasaku's touches and have now become signatures of the Salt Lake experience. So if you're going to be down in Driftwood, go ahead and stop. I mean, of course, uh, to me, the Salt Lake springs about whenever I hear the word Salt Lake and I think about it. Think of that huge warming pit as you walk in with the meat and the sausage hanging and the big fire underneath it keeping everything warm. I mean, it is just a vision to see. 104 her again her husband passed away in 1981 that was like 36 years ago wow 37 years ago 104 wow good for you and the driftwood widely considered to be one of texas's barbecue legend restaurants so considering how long it's been around man that's something else. So, if again, if you're going to be around, check it out. Keeping in that same line as far as eating, Americans will eat a record-breaking amount of eat, dare I say, meat, in 2018. How about that? According to NewYorkDailyNews.com, eating vegan for the new year might be trendy, but Americans aren't about to go meatless anytime soon. In fact, the opposite trend is rising this year. Americans are predicted to eat more meat than ever before. Pete is not going to be happy about this one, according to a report by the United States Department of Agriculture. The former record for the most red meat and poultry Americans ate per capita was set in 2004 at 221.9 pounds per year. This year, the number is predicted to soar above and beyond 222.2 pounds. That's a whole lot of burgers and chicken and poultry. Americans' health, always a growing concern, but this could be a step in the wrong direction. The government recommends eating five to six and a half ounces of protein per day, but those new predictions foresee adults devouring close to 10 from red meat and poultry alone. To keep up with the growing demand, the meat industry has had to beef up, no pun intended. Domestic meat production will surpass 100 billion pounds for the first time in American history, pushing large-scale farmers to shrug away from pressures to go cage-free and use more costly feed. Meatless proteins have upped their game as well. Companies like Beyond Meat have conjured up products like the Impossible Burger, reportedly imitating meat frighteningly well in both appearance and texture. The USDA notes that rather than being a precisely accurate measure, this data is popular proxy for actual food consumption and 
is especially useful for those interested in time series data. Still, we doubt their numbers are too far off. With the rise of paleo and the old adherence to low carb, the whole W30 making its annual January comeback, meat-heavy diets are more popular than ever. Yeah, baby. 100 billion. <laughs> we are fat. Oh, my God. 100 billion. <laughs> Look out now. I, I got to pull that back up and talk to the gentlemen about that next segment. Hey, folks, uh, let me talk to you quickly about the Pit Barrel Cooker. Pit Barrel makes cooking simple and fun. If you're on the lookout for a new cooker, whether it be midsize or traditional, I suggest the Pit Barrel Cooker. That's right. Uh, the versatility, all thanks to a revolutionary design that goes beyond traditional convection. Their hook and hang method places the food right in the center of the heat, so it's actually like a stationary rotisserie. All you need to know is that you get great, consistent results each and every time. Not only is it a fabulous cooking vessel, it's aesthetically sexy as well. Built to withstand heat thanks to its porcelain enamel finish, the pit barrel able to withstand any type of weather. Also extremely portable, fits in the back of most trucks, vans, and SUVs, ready to go wherever you are. Of course, all barbecue folks love accessories. The pit barrel doesn't disappoint here either. From rubs to the stainless steel rub shakers, the unique removable ash pan, the cut to form and control charcoal chimney, pit grips, turkey hangers, tinged grill grates, coffee mugs, drink koozies. There's a full line of accessories that really compete or complete the pit barrel cooking experience. Best part for $299 for the original pit barrel. A little less than that for pit barrel junior. Both come fully assembled, ready to cook on and ship for free right to your door. Not only do the cookers ship for free, but with so few returns, everything they sell ships for free to lower 48. No promo code, no coupon code needed. Don't take my word for it. The folks at Amazing Ribs continue to sing its praises for years in a row. Head on over to pitbarrelcooker.com and see what everybody's talking about. Be sure to check out their full collection of short how-to videos. Then pick up a Pit Barrel Standard and a Pit Barrel Junior for yourself. You can lend one out to your neighbors. You'll be the hit of the cul-de-sac. If you have any questions about what to order, you can contact them through their website or call 502-228-1222. Yes, they'll actually talk to you. There's a good chance it might be Amber or Noah picking up the phone to answer that question anyway. Find out what great customer service is all about. Head on over to pitbarrelcooker.com, 502-228-1222. The embedded correspondence segment refires as we come out of the break. Stick around. We'll be right back. Show, giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue, a man actually named Meathead, the author of a barbecue Bible, bloggers, reviewers, competitors, and manufacturers by the dozens. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show is brought to you by Smithfield. Championship pitmasters are winning with Smithfield. You can, too, commit to cooking with Smithfield this 2018 barbecue season. You'll receive smoke and swag just for participating. There's a few requirements. Pay a small shipping fee of 25 bones. Be a member of one of the sport's major sanctioning bodies. Be sure to come back, track your first place finishes, and pork and ribs to win great prizes through their walking with Smithfield incentive program. Once a Smithfield committed cook, show your Smithfield pride. Hashtag show us your Smithfield on Facebook and Instagram. Limited to 500 cooks. So hurry up for crying out loud. You're going to miss out. All right. It's this time of the month again where we invite David Huff, Steve Ray, Doug Scheiding, Texas, Tennessee, and Oklahoma in reverse order. It's called the Embedded Correspondence Segment. Gentlemen, appreciate the time as always. Uh, let me start off with a question here to the uh, members of the forum. I just did a story that the fact that Americans will eat a record-breaking amount of meat in 218, in fact, beef producers will be pushed to surpass 100 billion pounds of production. Steve, are you surprised at all by America's fascination with eating ourselves into oblivion? No, I don't think we're eating ourselves into oblivion. We aren't? Right? I think we're enjoying 
No, I think we're enjoying food. There's so many there's so many food shows, there's so many outlets for food, so many things that we can get our hands on and we can watch and read and it, it, food is just a is a fascinating a part of our lives now. Everything we do centers around food. You have friends over, we need food, we need drink, you go to a picnic, we need food, you go downtown, we got to go eat. It's uh, that's what we do now. It's the only growing sector in this country is food and restaurants. And uh, I think next year we'll eat more than in 2019 than we did in 2018. Doug, are you worried for our veritable safety that uh, we are in excess at this point? We've now rationalized it. No, look at all the people on the Adkins diet and all the proliferation of barbecue restaurants and, and uh, brisket fat's good for you. Haven't you read the articles? I haven't read one article that says that, Doug. Are you sandbagging? No, I, I will I will definitely send you one that the fat in brisket is better than uh, other types of uh, meat fat. So, Writ written by Daniel brisket. Vaughn, right, from Texas Monthly Barbecue. <laughs> David Hoff, are you worried at all? that we are uh, eating ourselves into oblivion or no big deal like the other two guys? Uh, no, but actually to, to Doug's point, I mean, I've been at one point on some version of the keto diet. I even considered talking about that on a segment at one point, but I mean, 70% of your diet on the keto is supposed to come from fat, 20 to 25 from protein and then 5% from carbs and I actually lost quite a bit of weight on it so uh, I think there's a way to eat meat red meat fish chicken whatever you want to do and still lose weight all right it's the embedded correspondence segment here we're going to start with David Huff this time around the Oklahoma correspondent what uh, what are we up to with you tonight well, Greg, I've been listening to the show a little over a year now, and I know that you definitely have some, uh, you know, who's who of barbecue guests on the show. And I've been going to their different websites and checking them out and looking at recipes. And I just thought I would share um, three of the recipes that I've made from the sites. I took pictures and they all turned out really well. So these guys really know their stuff. Um, I went with uh, Stephen Reichlin. I went to the Barbecue Bible website. All right. And this was more for the process, but it was his salt and pepper beef ribs. Uh, I absolutely love uh, the beef ribs. And when you set them down on the plate, it practically looks like a big steak on the bone. Uh, it's just it's wonderful. It's impressive. Um, you know, it's pretty simple to do, but it's just the simplicity of it. Salt, black pepper, buy short ribs at Costco keep the rub simple. I've tried it with other rubs, but actually just keeping it simple like this turned out really well. You just cook them until they're tender like you would a brisket. You know, look for the color. Uh, I didn't wrap these because I wanted to really keep the bark on there and there's so much fat. I think short ribs is the fattiest piece of meat that you can get off of the cow, if I remember correctly. And so uh, the amount of fat in there keeps it really moist and juicy and uh, his salt and pepper uh, beef ribs turned out really good. It was a hit with my family, even my wife, who usually likes fall off the bone tender pork ribs like the beef ribs. Do you have to use knife and fork eventually, or are they tender enough you just kind of pull apart, or they would act like a uh, a tender pork rib? Um, the, so further away from the bone would act like a tender pork rib, but the meat that's closer to the bone, there's actually quite a bit of, I don't know if it's cartilage or there, there's something between the meat and the bone that's not very appetizing. So you would want to probably cut that part away from the bone. It won't pull off of the bone clean like a pork rib would. But uh, you can see with the presentation there, I mean, that's, you know, a big piece of meat sticking there on that bone. And they serve them in a lot of fancy restaurants and uh, it turned out real well. All right. Uh, what's um, next? The second one was uh, off of Jess Prowl's website, The Hardcore Carnivore. It's actually JessPryles.com, and it was the uh, smoked scotch eggs. Um, you know, scotch eggs are fun to make. They're usually deep fried, and her uh, recipe was a little bit different. You hard boil an egg for six minutes, so that way the white's set up, uh, but the yolk is still runny inside. You take a roll of sausage, divide it into six, um, flatten the sausage out like a pancake, and then put the egg in the middle and then wrap the sausage around the egg and then put it in the smoker for about 40, 45 minutes. And then her recipe called to glaze it with barbecue sauce uh, for the last 10. I changed that up a little since it was for breakfast and I took maple syrup with a little bit of horseradish so you get the sweet and spicy and glazed it up. 
then you can see there when you cut down through the middle of it. I mean, the presentation's kind of neat. It's basically breakfast all in, you know, one piece there. You got the sausage, the egg, and you can put a little bit of cheese in there if you want. It's really tasty, and it's impressive to your friends when they cut through that, and it, they, that's what they get to look at. So you're hard boiling a shell and everything for six minutes and then cool peel and then wrap the meat around you got it you put actually wow. you take the eggs and put it in an ice bath so after yep. six minutes in boiling water ice bath to stop it my tip would be use eggs that have been sitting in your fridge for a while um, the fresher eggs are actually harder to peel. They don't come off as a membrane as easily. Mm. So take eggs that have been sitting in the fridge for a little bit, and then the shells will come off easier. So is that what the deal is? I've, I, I, I'm not a very big uh, hard-boiled egg eater, per se, but sometimes I am tasked with boiling eggs and then peeling them, and inevitably they come out like you know, a horribly diseased, acne-ridden teenager's face. You know, it's all <laughs> pocked up. And I become growingly frustrated with each egg that I just feel completely useless not being able to peel them properly and have a nice outside. So I need to I need to use older eggs is what you're saying. Yeah, I've, I've gone through a batch of eggs where I threw the last four out because, you know, the, the first six or whatever I was trying just – I couldn't – there were chunks out of them. The eggs yep. fell in half. Yeah, it was a mess. And there's a bunch of tricks on the book. There's even one where you put a pinhole in one side and kind of take a knife and cut off the other end, and, and guys will literally blow the egg out of the shell. There's videos you can see on YouTube and stuff. I, none of that has ever worked. The, the best thing I've found to peel an egg is use eggs that aren't as fresh, um, been sitting around in the fridge for a little bit, you know, a week or so, and then uh, I, I, it's a lot easier to pull them off. The membrane comes right off. Hmm. Interesting. And uh, taste-wise, tastes good stuff, right? Yeah, it tastes real good. All right. And then the last um, one, it looked like you had corned beef. Yeah, so this was Meathead's, uh, almost Katz's, uh, corned beef and pastrami. And this was a little bit of an undertaking for me. I was a little bit scared because it's quite a process. I uh, bought a Packer brisket, took off the point, trimmed off the fat, um, except for about you know a quarter to an eighth of an inch. And then I cut the flat in half. So I had three equal chunks of meat that were about three and a half pounds. Um, his website is great because it has uh, the calculator for the curing salt. You don't want to use too much of that. You want to use the right amount for the amount of liquid in the brine and then the amount of meat uh, by the pound. And uh, let it brine in the fridge for six days. Pulled it out and let it soak for uh, overnight in just fresh water to pull out some of that salt. And then I took one part of the flat and I actually put it in a sous vide bag and cooked it for 10 hours at 180 degrees in sous vide just for the corned beef. Hmm. And it turned out great. I think there's a picture there where you can see the tenderness. I mean, it just dripped right over a knife without any problem, uh, cut to about the thickness of a pencil. And then um, I took the other part, I took the point and the other part of the flat and put the rub on it that Meathead suggested and um, let it set in the fridge for a day so that the rub would set up and then I smoked it and uh, served it to my family and they said it was the best pastrami they ever had and I really followed his recipe to a T so kudos to Meathead on that um, it turned out very very well and was a big hit have you ever been to Katz's Deli to do a side-by-side -side or a, uh, a top level down comparison I have I have not. There is a restaurant in Oklahoma City that actually serves homemade pastrami with uh, eggs for breakfast. Um, that's the best pastrami I'd ever had up to this point. And then I tried this, and uh, I, I would put it right up next to that. His recipe is really good. So I'd definitely make it again. It's a bit of a process. I think all in, um, it was a Saturday to a Sunday with uh, the full brine and the, the letting it rest in the water and then the rub and everything. So the time it came out of smoker, it was, uh, uh, you know, eight, eight days, but I felt it was worth it. Steve, have you made any of these or do you have any reaction to what uh, David has discussed here on his portion of the segment? No, I haven't made any of the things that uh, David has made. The only thing I do that and, and I have in common with David is go to uh, Jess Brow's website. But that's just for browsing. What I, what I have been into, though, is I, last year I was into dry-aged steak. I was I was wrapping, you know, the, the big green Craig guy was talking about wrapping steak in gauze and cheesecloth. I did that last year and had a lot of success at that. But this year I've gotten into to uh, curing my own bacon here at the house. And uh, it is, without a doubt, 
the the most delicious uh, piece of meat, the thing that when you serve it to friends, it impresses them. It, it just tastes fantastic. Everybody loves it. And I've had more fun making that and then serving it to my friends. And one more thing, uh, David, I have done too. I've gotten into I've gotten into eggs myself. I've been putting eggs on everything. I I, I bought these little these metal circles for my griddle. I break the egg, put it into the the metal circle, and it makes like an egg McMuffin egg. Hmm. And I'll put it on my hamburgers. I put it on cheeseburgers. Um, anything anything that I think that I might like, and I add an egg to it. And to me, it just makes it much more delicious and much more interesting. So I, I know what you're, David. I know exactly what you're doing. It's very, it's very exciting, and it's very um, satisfying to uh, go to these different sites and get these recipes and try them at the house. And when your friends like it too, it, it makes it even better. Doug, you're a world championship award-winning pit master. Do you do Scotch eggs? Do you do the pastrami? Do you have any of these favorites that David's talked about? I haven't done any. Well, first of all, I wouldn't do Scotch eggs because the the egg hard boiled eggs just totally gross grosses me out. So I <laughs> is that a texture thing that. for you or what? Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I don't like flan. I don't like tapioca. I just <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like the eyeballs staring staring at me. So, uh, but I'll have scrambled eggs all the time. Um, but um, the pastrami is uh, sounds pretty interesting. Sounds like a lot of work, and David just kind of convinced me it's still a lot of work. I've been to Katz's <laughs> Deli. It, it's good, but um, I'd rather just have regular brisket than rather go, go through all of that. Um, I've actually been working on a couple of recipes. So there's a, uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's called Mississippi Pot Pie. Uh, have you heard of this, Greg? No, I haven't. It's actually, well, it's supposed to be made in a crock pot, but of course uh, mm. I'll, I'll cook it in a Dutch oven. Um, it's just five ingredients. It's it's like chuck roast. It's um, a package of ranch dressing. You can you can look it up. Package of ranch dressing and a package of uh, dark brown gravy, um, butter, and the Greek peppers called pepperoncino peppers. Mm -hmm. So I've actually been working on a recipe for uh, Traeger and or uh, Head Country and doing a brisket uh, kind of texas spin on that so i've been doing doing that over the last couple of weeks and uh, this weekend is the san antonio rodeo i'm actually uh, going to enter carne gasada again last year i entered that and got 17th and so i've been working on uh, on a recipe for that my wife has been working on a thing called monkey bread which is a dessert that uh, has char you know semi-sweet chocolate inside of like a uh, crescent roll so um, and it's kind of made in the shape of a bunt cake. So she's been working on that. So we've been working on uh, our own recipes and really not following other people's for the most part. Uh, Doug, let's stay with you. Uh, we got about five minutes before we have to go to the first break. Um, let's get into one of your hot takes for your segment. Okay, sure. Well, I, I think last week, or excuse me, last month, I talked about how uh, I gave myself the uh, meter wireless uh, Correct. Uh, thermometer for my for a Christmas when I wrapped it. I bought it myself and wrapped it And since my wife wasn't going to get me anything. And so uh, to a certain extent, I've, I guilt her, guilted her into buying me something for our uh, half-year anniversary, which was on January 1st. Half-year anniversary. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's actually okay. I, I, we, we celebrate that more than the holidays, which is funny. But uh, so yeah, January 1st. So she got me, there's a, a cook down here called, uh, his name is Kelly Curtis of Panther, uh, Panther Creek. And he has been posting these pictures of something that he cooks with and he's got three of them. Uh -huh. And so she was intrigued and I was talking, so she actually bought me one. It's called an air fryer. Okay. And it's a, it's a device. It's, you know, it's not an Instapot or anything. It basically uses forced convection air and it, and it, uh, has a, a little tray that, that you slide in and this thing basically fries without oil. It's been awesome. I've done, awesome. I've had it, I guess what, three weeks now. Yeah. And I use it every weekend. Uh, I've done, you can make fried chicken. I've done wings. Um, this weekend I cooked a steak in there and I cooked one on the Traeger just to kind of see. Uh, my wife picked it out 
uh, fairly quickly, but um, the Traeger had the you know the smoke on it, but the uh, the air fryer actually had like a crust on the top of it. She that that she liked, but um, we've done Brussels sprouts, uh, French fries, pork chops, uh, sashito peppers, um, done all kinds of things, and uh, so she bought me the Go Wise. Uh, she says size matters, and so she bought the <laughs> largest one, which is a Go Wise 5.8 quarts. And uh, it's really neat. It's fast. You can, you know, cook a steak. I think what? Yeah, I guess it took eight eight minutes. I flipped it, and then another eight minutes, just like a normal grill. Um, no oil. It's healthier. Um, really easy cleanup. So uh, for the most part, uh, I think my my microwave will uh, be given to Goodwill here soon. What, do so you, what kind I didn't of a know price if anybody tag else had any? Um, I think that, uh, she paid about one hundred and forty dollars for this one. So, all right, Steve, and, let's... And, and it is no, go ahead, Doug. One of the larger ones. So. This is one yeah, of the it's one of the larger ones. So, yeah, so get a larger one if you do decide to get one. Steve, do we want to make fun of Doug at all for a uh, forced air fryer at all, or are we going to uh, give him a pass? No, he's, uh, he's watching that Home Shopping Network. I can tell. Um, you know, I, I got a, uh, I got a real neat thing. I bought a. Uh, it's called a Volrath countertop convection oven, and it, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty pretty good one, and I've got it at the gas station, and this thing has is we have used it for making biscuits, sausage, and and I was so inspired by David and Greg's conversation a few weeks ago about bacon in the oven, Doug. <laughs> that I bought this and I've been doing my bacon a la David Huff method. And it is utterly, it's, it's just delicious. And this thing has been this, I'm like you with the microwave. We, we don't even use the microwave anymore because this makes food taste so much better. It cooks so fast because it is convection and it has this super neat thing. It has a browning top and I guess it would be a, a broiler. And if you want to get the, the bacon on the top, you just turn a knob and the top comes on real hot and you can, you know, sear the top of the bacon and kind of finish it off. If you want to get a little brown on the biscuits, uh, you can turn that on and just for a, just for about a minute, 45 seconds to a minute, get a real nice brown tone to the top of the biscuits. And it, it's one of those things that, you know, I've, always, I've had a cheap one before, you know, a little countertop toaster oven, but I spent a few extra dollars on this thing and it is a quality product. And what I'm finding out as I as I journey down the food path is when you buy a better cooker, a better piece of equipment, your food comes out even better. What kind of a price tag is on your cooker there, Steve? Uh, it was it was about a thousand dollars. I, it was about a thousand bucks. Oh, I got it oh my all right. It's I know, I know. a little more than 150 bucks on that air fryer. I gotta say. <laughs> well, you you know it's uh it was a business expense. It was in, uh, at the end uh, of the year, and you know you got to buy some stuff to like uh like sign or like uh, Kramer says in Seinfeld, just write it off. <laughs> yeah, just write it off. Just write exactly it off. Right. All right. We don't uh, know what that means, but we just write it up. That's right. We'll just do it. Uh, David, we'll come back here in a second. We'll get your take on the forced air fryer. We're at the embedded correspondence segment halfway through. Let me talk to you quickly about Green Mountain Grills. Now, these folks, they have it figured out. They got three different sizes. So like Steve is just talking about, you know, you want to buy some of the, the best stuff that you have out there. Your food's going to taste better. It's going to last longer. It's going to provide you with a better cooking experience. Green Mountain Grill also believes in these principles. If you want something big, Jim Bowie is the one you want to look at. You probably get six pork butts on there if you do it right. In pans, no less. You can probably get more if you just want to stick them on there without any pans. Number of racks of ribs. Definitely whole pack or briskets in there. No problem. Then you have a medium-sized cooker called the Davy, uh, the Daniel Boone. And then the smallest one, like for tailgates and so forth, the Davy Crockett. Now, here's something you need to pay close attention to, especially if you like these high-heat pizzas. I've been talking about them for a year now. They're really continuing to take off in popularity. But who has the money? Twenty-five dollars and $30,000 for these Forno Bravo ovens coming over from Italy. 
Do you want to import that or do you want to get a Jim Bowie or a Daniel Boone and then get the Green Mountain Grill high heat pizza insert for not $20,000, not even $1,000, about 150 bucks or so. Just take out the guts of either cooker, slap that pizza attachment right on the burn pot, set your cooker to 350 degrees. That'll put it about 700 degrees on the stone. Make your cooking adjustments from there. And then it's a pizza party, folks. Not only can you do the barbecue foods, if you want to do pizza the next day or have a huge pizza party because you're having a birthday for kids, this is how you can do it very inexpensively. 135, 140, 150 bucks or whatever it is. Come on, you can't beat it. Runs on pellets. You got that wood-fired flavor as well. And again, if you want to go, if you want to throw caution to the wind, set that cooker to 500 degrees. It'll be 1,000 degrees on the stone. You will have zero room for error. But wow, you can tell everybody you're cooking at 1,000 degrees if you want. Then you can really throw caution to the wind. Take out the pizza stone. Line the bottom of that stainless with aluminum foil. Put a set of grill grates in there and start grilling. Come on now. You know you're going to do it. The website, if you want to check it out, is GreenMountainGrills.com. That's GreenMountainGrills.com. They can give you pellets to fire those cookers as well. And then again, I urge you to check out that pizza attachment. We are back with more embedded correspondence segment right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via Bluetooth. If you have Alexa or Google Assistant in your home, you're lucky because Fireboard fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com that's fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232 that's the good folks over at fireboard as we continue with the embedded correspondence segment uh david let's go to you for your reaction to the air fryer is that something you're down with uh have you seen it i've seen them on television all the while now here over the last couple weeks so uh, i'm very enthused to hear doug's positive take on it. what is what's your take david well, before we get to that, Greg, I think uh -oh. we need to give congratulations. I, I, I believe you pulled off a successful cook of bacon in your oven. Uh -huh. I yes, I did. I didn't share that over publicly, but I did take pictures and send them to you privately through email. So uh, Doug was right, by the way. So I think uh, not only do I need proper credit, which is most important, but uh, Doug probably needs most of the credit because he said, get the bacon off that rack. And I think that made all the difference. Well, it looked good, other than the weird shape of the bacon. I thought it looked like it was uh, really good. Yeah, I can't help the, the way uh, the bacon is, right? <laughs> right. The air fryer, you know, my wife's always trying to get me to eat healthier. Uh, I love French fries and fried potatoes, so if I can get those in my diet and get out the oil, um, I, I'd be willing to try it for sure. It didn't look very big, Doug, on the picture. I mean, the one picture showed that it was there was a lot of meat going in it, but the one that had the French fries, it didn't look like it was a very big tray, so I don't know. You know how much capacity yeah, that actually held yeah it's it's probably seven inches by seven inches or so so i mean you could get comfortably two to three you know normal size steaks uh you know two thighs and maybe two drums in it uh comfortably without it touching okay not bad for a two-person meal the, the the devices that i've tried recently um i got a, a sous vide uh, about six months ago mm -hmm. And um, I've tried different things in that. I, I'm not as impressed with red meat out of the sous vide. I think if you can cook a good steak and not overcook it, um, the results are, are better on the grill or, or cast iron. Um, but I was very impressed with chicken, uh, fish, and I actually did lobster in it over the weekend. Um, oh. And those results were great, especially the lobster. Because usually when you cook lobster, any other method, the outside of it gets a little bit higher heat and it gets a little tough and chewy but the inside is usually you know nice and moist and when you do it in the sous vide i put garlic for uh some some butter in there and a little bit of rosemary and sealed it up and it was like it poached in its own butter and juices so i thought the sous vide was fantastic for certain things and then the other uh device that i purchased was the steak ager uh, <laughs> we're all talking about um you know aged meat um 
I had pros and cons with the stake ager. Um, I thought that it worked well. Part of my problem is my wife wouldn't give me space in the fridge inside the house, so I had to use the fridge in the garage, which is very susceptible to temperatures. So in Oklahoma in the summer where it was very hot, your humidity was maintained where it needed to be inside the fridge, but sometimes those temperatures creeped up above 40 degrees, and for food safety, that wasn't very good. Um, and then on the flip side, in the winter, when the fridge stayed cold enough outside, the air was so dry, I had trouble maintaining humidity. So I think the end product suffered because while the flavors that everyone talks about, the nuttiness, the real beefy flavor of a dry-aged steak was there, the texture that I've had in dry-aged meat at like David Burke's restaurant in Chicago, or somebody who really knows what they're doing, the texture wasn't there. And I think it was just because I lost so much um, mass to, on the outside, having to trim it all off. I lost all the moisture in the meat, so I was a little disappointed. And then the other part of it, you really need to buy when you're going to trim. You lose so much, you need to buy as big of a piece of meat as you can, usually with the bone side on, so that way one whole side is protected. And with, you know, you can only fit about an eight pound roast in that thing, mm. and it really only leaves you enough for maybe one meal. And waiting 45 days, that meal better be <laughs> damn good. Did uh, Big Green Craig inspire you to get umami bags? I've done a lot of reading about that, and there's just some pros and cons. Um, and, you know, I spent 200 bucks on the steak ager, so my wife's telling me uh -huh. I better use that more anyway. So, <laughs> Steve, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Steve, you're up. Go ahead. I am here. You know, fellas, I try to be a renaissance man, and I try to live by the mantra. <laughs> the only thing certain about education is it should remain unfinished, and that is why Next month, I'm going to go to my third barbecue school down in Atlanta wow. at the airport Marriott. But this, I've been to two uh, barbecue schools by top tier guys, both of them nationally known celebrity type cooks. No names, please, and, or do you want to call them out the, by name, Steve? No, I, I gave Rub, Rub Bagby and um, Donnie Bragg. All right. You're right. Elite Russell level was the first one. Elite level. And Donnie was the second one. All right. And and learned a lot in both of them. Um, most of the time, when people go to these schools, their results are they really they improve. I am the exception to that rule. <laughs> to this day, when I pull a pork butt out of a smoker, I am at a complete loss at what to do with it after I trim after I trim and slice the money muscle. My pork scores are just horrible. Um, my overall scores are, they're not where they should be after somebody who has gone to two professional schools. So what, what I want to throw out to the panel today is, when do you think a person should go to a school? Did I go too early? Did I wait too late? Uh, should I have cooked a couple years using information from the internet and then gone to a school? And the other point I want to bring up is when you go to these schools, is it is it sort of like an inbreded family where the family tree looks like a totem pole because everybody's doing the same thing. And and I'm afraid that, Doug, like like you said earlier in a conversation we had, the the imagination suffers and and well, that's one of the things that may hurt overall barbecue competitions. So I would like to get a take on when do you think a person should go to school, a barbecue school, and what should they look to take away from that experience? Well, I want uh, David to answer this first because he's, well, I mean, there's nobody greener than me, of course, but I have no aspiration of getting in. However, I do have a take on it. But uh, David, you're like the most green or new to competition barbecue. So what do you think? Yeah, Steve, this is a great question. And I'll tell you, I don't know that you need to go to a school, but what you absolutely need to do, uh, I've cooked mainly KCBS uh, sanctioned events, and you absolutely need to go to one of their judging classes. So I jumped right in uh, to a competition, and I'm like, I'm going to cook exactly how I cook at home. People love my food. Here we go. Crispy chicken skin, fall apart tender ribs. We're going to be in great shape. And I think I placed like 70 out of 100. Just hit me across <laughs> the face. And I was like, I don't understand. And then I, I went to a, a contest where I got uh, friends with the 
guys next door and they started telling me, you know, Wagyu briskets and bite through chicken and I never heard of these things. So you learn a lot from experience, but then I went to a KCBS judge class at the University of uh, Oklahoma State University and um, I learned more at that class, learning how to be a judge, learning what they look for, um, and, and I felt more prepared to go out and hit the circuit, understanding how judges are judging. Now, the other part of your question I absolutely agree with. I'm afraid that everybody's cooking to the same, I mean, flavor profiles might change, but everyone's cooking for the same tenderness, the same consistency, the same look in the boxes with very little variation. I think competition barbecue is just becoming to where, I mean, money's starting to separate teams. Um, I mean, the, the pros are still the pros, don't get me wrong. Travis Clark can't do what he did without knowing, you know, absolutely how to cook. But I think you're cooking to a mark that everyone's trying to reach, and I think it's taken a lot of the creativity out of it. Doug, you're the most seasoned out of all of us. What do you think? Well, it's um, yeah, it's it's interesting. My opinion has somewhat changed on this. Um, when I first got into uh, to competition barbecue, I don't think you had to go to a class. I think uh, you know, no, at that time, that was in 2009. People weren't teaching classes. They weren't giving away their secrets. And now there seems to be a proliferation of classes. I mean, I, I teach classes for Traeger. I've been to five. I've been to uh, Craig Sherry, Arnie Segovia, um, my two brothers from a different mother, CJ and Chad Ward, and uh, also Danielle DVQ. So I've been to those, those five classes. So um, David brings up a great point. I think judging is the way to kind of short circuit before going to a class. Um, to kind of get an idea of what people are cooking. So uh, I, I think that's good because th the first five, six years, I would always go and, and judge. Uh, here in Texas, it's different. We're not certified like KCBS, you know, IBCA. It's just the average Joe. Um, but uh, I would go and judge uh, as a judge to different different uh, cook-offs, uh, probably about two a year, just to kind of see what, you know, everyone was doing. And largely... Um, the last few, I stopped doing it actually, because the last couple I did, it was all kind of tasting the same. It was either bad or it was all pretty good. And I think that's partially because of the classes. I think if, if someone goes, goes to a class and, and Steve, this was your question on the takeaway. I think if someone goes to the, to a class and then cooks the exact recipe, which they learn in the class. That's going to kill competition. I actually like the imagination. I think you need to go and in each category, whether it's chicken, ribs, brisket, you know, pork, if, uh, if they're teaching that and take one, two or three, maybe techniques or a certain rub or something like that and take that as a, a takeaway from the, uh, the class and not the actual recipe. Use what you learn there and use it to, on your own recipes. And I wish more people did that versus just cooking, you know, basically just cooking the same, you know, the same recipe that everyone else does. John Dawson on the YouTube Instant Chat is weighing in saying it's the NASCARification of competition barbecue. Same cars, different graphics. So similar here when we're talking about competition barbecue. And here's my take because I'm talking to pitmasters the the elite level pitmasters weekend in uh, or each tuesday for the last 12 years here's the deal uh, when should you take a class you need to take a class when you feel you need to take a class whether that be right off the bat or whether that be five competitions in i agree with david as well i think you should first be a judge or sit in on a what judges are eating and get to know uh, a how are the judges being trained on what is supposed to be the best barbecue, because I believe, unless I'm mistaken, they have teams overcook stuff on purpose so they can delineate between what's good and what's bad. But that's kind of where the winning barbecue is set. And so once you have that background, you're able to either start cooking on your own and get those competitions under your belt and then decide, okay, well, now I want to go take a class with a top ranking pit master. The other thing is cost. How much do you want to spend on a class? You can take classes for a few hundred dollars. You can take classes 
more traditionally in that five to seven hundred fifty dollar range. I think last year Tuffy Stone was on the high end at nine fifty. This year you're seeing uh, Fred Robles put on a class fifteen hundred dollars a person, which seems extravagant when you say it out loud. But let's break it down. How much is a competition cooking you if you can take a two day class with Fred, who's widely considered to be one of the top cooks in the country right now, and he's doing dual competition. I mean, he's mostly Texas based, but he's gone into KCBS. He's done very well in World Food Championships. Is it worth spending fifteen hundred dollars where your learning curve might get sped up seven, eight, ten, twelve competitions, uh, and you don't have to go through that learning curve, and you're spending what eight hundred dollars, twelve hundred dollars, thirteen hundred dollars per competition? So when you look at it that way, is $1,500 really that much to invest in yourself if you believe that's going to help you? Now, as far as the homogenization of flavor profiles is concerned, that's something that cooks and judges have done to themselves unknowingly. The cost of competition is so much these days, and there is so much on the line. By the way, there's so much on the line for like so few dollars on the payout, which is completely ridiculous. And I continue to uh, continue to rail against that. That's uh, one of the biggest reasons why I would never even consider competing anyway. However, if you're going to spend all this money and all of this time and all of this effort, and you're taking these classes, you're not going to de- you're not going to take this guy's cooking method and then decide, okay, well. I'm going to cook it like that, but I'm going to use my own flavors or I'm going to get really outside the box and add a lot of this or add a lot of that that is completely outside the winning, the gen, the general winning flavor profile. If you're, unfortunately, creativity is not rewarded in competition barbecue at this point. I don't know what it's going to take, if it's going to take half the field to really push the boundaries of a flavor profile. But to me, if you turn something in and the judge goes, Oh, well, that doesn't taste like everything else. His first thought isn't, and we should reward that because in every other line it's winning. I think you get ticked down for that, and you're putting yourself at a better position to not win than to stand out from the crowd. And that's why you see the homogenization of flavor profile because nobody wants to get outside the box and put themselves in a disadvantage of winning because the cost is so much. That's probably what needs to get fixed. More competitions like a guinea pig or a cost-controlled competition, so you're not worried about that, so you're not afraid to take the chances of doing this kind of a a flavor profile or that kind of a flavor profile that really diverges away from the the middle-of-the-road, least offensive barbecue that is cooked to the best tenderness, according to everybody else. That's my take. Well, I I agree, Greg. And and getting back to the imagination, when you – you're sitting there in your in your cook trailer getting ready to turn in your box and you're, and you're cooking the food. Uh, I know myself, uh, imagination is the furthest thing from my mind. I'm trying to think what I learned in the last class right. that I took. I'm, I'm going over my notes because, you know, imagination's fun in your backyard. But when you turn that, that box in, you know, I'm looking for a top 10, you know, in, in anything. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not getting it, and that's why I almost feel like the uh, the bad Catholic that has to go to confession every now and then just to get a just to kind of get a reboot. And that's why I'm going down to this school in February because I I feel like um, I've lost something from the other two schools that I went to, and I'm going to go down to Scott Smith School who just won the uh, Sam's Club Professional Barbecue Tour, and I want to take his because he not only he cooks especially in my region, within my 150-mile uh, circle of comfort that I call it, that I compete in. And I'm hoping that maybe I can take the things away from him that makes him do so well in my area, and I can up my game a little bit. But then, you know, if I do up my game, do I do I pat myself on the back, or do I pat, you know, thank Scott? So, you know, am I just, a, is, it, is, it, is being a carbon copy and, uh, you know, winning okay, or... You know, you know, it's just it's one of those con- situations where, you know, you want to do well, you want to do well on your own, but if you if you copy somebody and you and you do well, you know, you take the money, and I guess you just grin and bear it. But, well, I think you got to re- you got to reconcile that with yourself before you start, right? I mean, you, if you're if you're going to be okay with that, or if you think there's something wrong with that, 
then I guess you got to get right oh, with no, yourself no, when you go you, to the if competition. You <laughs> if you pay for it, I mean, I don't think I mean, it's not going to bother me. But it's just it's the homogenization of uh, competition barbecue, and I don't know if that's the the right road to head down. But I will say this, oh Doug, the uh, the schools that these uh, gentlemen are teaching, they all fill up. So there's mm -hmm. a, there's an interest in competition barbecue that's still out there, and and I still think it's growing. I don't I don't think that it's uh, and I think it's shifting a little bit. Uh, I think there's going to be more contests that are going to be different, maybe like the World Food Championships that are just a little bit more interesting. And David, getting back to your 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 first uh, take this, tonight of all the different things to cook, I know down at the World Food Championships, the the interesting thing wasn't at the barbecue sites; it was in the under that tent, David, where they were cooking all kinds of different food. That's where the action was, and that's where it was interesting. And uh, I would not be surprised to see uh, our sport barbecue morph into some of that. And I tell you, I think I would welcome that. And um, maybe that's maybe that's where all this is going to go. You might like I saw where Travis's school he's adding the uh, steak contest um, school. I think that's a fantastic idea. He's he's very good at steak, and so that's just a proliferation of this sport that that it's it's getting just a little bit bigger, and there's more things coming down the pike. I know at the World Food Championships I did the uh, pork loin competition. I didn't do well, but I enjoyed it and uh, thought I had a thought I had a decent. To cook, I finished in the bottom third. I'm used to that, but it was a lot of fun. And but it was just something you know different than just barbecue. So you know, I'm hoping that when I go to this school, I can I can up my scores in the, my, uh, the upcoming year. But I th I'm hoping I can uh, maybe take some things away from Scott School that I can use, you know, here in the backyard and maybe use um, cooking other kinds of foods in different types of contests. Uh Steve and Doug, I, I want to point out something. Uh, I believe last month I went around the panel really quickly and said, do you think there's going to be a 2018 National Barbecue Tour this year? Uh, we all, of course, said uh, no. We yeah. were right. And the eternal optimist, uh, David Huff, said, oh, yeah, there's going to be one. Mm -hmm. well, oh, jeez. Look what it is. Are you surprised at that, David, or are you just trying to take the other side? Yeah, I figured some may need to be the other side to keep things interesting. Well, I think they uh, made it interesting all on their own this time around. There's no doubt yes, about that. They uh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. We have David Hoff, Steve Ray, Doug Scheiding, uh, Texas, Tennessee, and Oklahoma represented here in the Embedded Correspondence segment. It happens every month. Gentlemen, always appreciate the time. Thanks so much for doing it, and we'll see you again next month. You Thanks, bet, guys. Greg. Thank you. Always a Greg. pleasure. See you, boys. There they are. The embedded correspondence here for the Barbecue Central show. Let me go ahead and get everybody hung up on here. There we go. And uh, we will get ready to head on out here. Great talk about uh, competition barbecue. I mean, that's it. Oh, by the way, Steve, I meant to mention this. John Dawson brings up a good point. Cosmos competition DVD, like Co Cosmos Q. Darian had released a competition DVD series a little while back. And as John says, great idea. So good stuff. You don't have to travel anywhere. It's fairly inexpensive. And whenever you need a refresher, put in the DVD and away you go, right? There you go. All right. All the way back in the first hour, we had, oh, wait. See what I didn't do? I didn't remove my files to end on time. All right, here we go. All the way back in the first hour, we talked with Mark Lambert from Sweet Swine of Mine, National Barbecue Association's current sitting president, about the I Am Barbecue 2018 conference, nbbqa.com or imbbq2018.com if you want to register for that. I'll be there. That'll be March 14th through the 17th. I'll be broadcasting live Thursday, Friday, Saturday for a few hours each day. Then we talked with Big Green Craig, Craig Tabor, biggreencraig.com, about dry aging, and then we had the embedded correspondence segment. Big show planned for next week. Don't forget Brad Leininger is going to be on talking about uh, how the KCB has shorted the Team of the Year payouts and then how they made it good, and uh, more importantly, if everybody's happy and buying it. September 11th, 2001, I will never forget. Until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, this is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now.